Hello, my name is Michael Rickards and I'm the Executive Director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy. We're delighted today on our TV forum to have a guest who will help us explore an issue that we've spent a considerable amount of time on in previous sessions. Her name is Linda Walder Fiddle and she is the Director of the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation and she's come here to talk again about the issue of autism. Linda, thank you very much for coming here today. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Now you were at our disabilities conference up in, uh, uh, up in uh, uh, East Rutherford? Yes, I was. Right by with us and Dr. Uh, Sal Pizarro? Yes, I was. I had the pleasure of being there. I thought you had some great presentations that day. It was wonderful. Uh, we've done a three-part series, I believe, on autism in the past. And I know of your interest. I know you had a son who had autism and died very young. And you created in his memory, which I think is wonderful, a foundation to deal with some of the questions of autism, which isn't just a children's disease, as you pointed out, but is something that goes on through maturity. And we discussed that a little bit at the previous uh, um, sessions that we've had, because people usually don't think about autism in that way. But the question I had, and I want to ask you this, mm -hmm. because I'm not sure I got an answer after three sessions. What is autism? Autism really is a complex neurological, I say challenge, I, I like to use the word challenge, where individuals have difficulty with social interactions. There are some behavioral components, many people, and there are some emotional issues as well and the the combination of all of these um, is really diverse in the sense that people on the spectrum are individuals and the impact of all of those three different challenges is different on each individual so it's very difficult to actually define autism in terms of well you like if you cut your finger you see a, a cut on your finger and you and you can say if you cut your finger and I cut my finger it looks pretty much the same but with autism the impact of the challenges is different in each individual so that's what makes it difficult to define how do you feel about the 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 very controversial notion that autism is due to mass inoculations well, I feel that that has not been proven by science and, and you know, it's interesting because we're reading in the papers every day now how more and more children, because of the information and, and really what's been proven to be misinformation is out there, so they're not being inoculated. And some of these, these diseases, these really can be fatal diseases, like, are coming back. Uh, because their people are not being inoculated, children are not being inoculated. So they've really proven that, as far as I know, that vaccines are safe um, and that they're really important to the health and well-being of our citizens so and our children. Well, why are we having such a tremendous increase in the number of, of cases of autism? Mm -hmm. I can understand why we're having such an increase in diabetes, we're getting bigger and heavier and we're eating more sugar and throwing ourselves off. But autism is more complicated. Yes. Why are we having so many more autism cases in this nation? I don't necessarily think we have more. I think we're better at diagnosing and identifying. So when my son, which, uh, you know, now going back 15 years ago when he was a little boy, uh, doctors, and we were at great doctors um, in New York, um, and you know, there's great doctors everywhere in the country um, and in the world, but our doctors were excellent pediatricians, and yet they weren't even identifying autism. So, or the, 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 the characteristics and the markers, as we say, um, when children aren't reaching certain milestones. Today, I think most pediatricians are trained to identify these markers, and we've also learned that as soon as they're diagnosed, the best treatment for autism is to get children into uh, some kind of therapeutic situation, play therapy, speech and language therapy, and these have been proven the earlier you get children into these um, kinds of therapies, um, their, their conditions are much mitigated 
Uh, so the sooner the better, and I think we're doing a much better job of diagnosing. Um, an additional answer to that question is that a lot of, of people who were not part of the spectrum, what's called the autism spectrum, are now being identified as part of that spectrum. I'm speaking mostly of individuals who are diagnosed with Asperger's Asperger syndrome. syndrome. So now the whole um, array, array of individuals living with Asperger's syndrome are now considered part of the autism spectrum. So the early diagnosis and the more prevalent diagnosis plus in, um, enlarging the spectrum, in my view, has created a, a larger uh, population of people living with autism. Why are the, the number of autistic children so high in New Jersey and in California? Well, I actually think New Jersey does a great job in identifying individuals living with autism and they also do a great job in terms of we have wonderful schools here compared to the rest of the country. We have a wonderful science going on here compared to the rest of the country. So New Jersey is really a leader. And because it's a leader, we, we hear about it more. There are more children diagnosed for the reasons I uh, previously stated. And uh, there's more opportunities for treatment here. How about California? Yeah. California, well, it's also a very large state, and I also think they're quite progressive. Uh, we have several programs that the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation has spearheaded in California, and, you know, they're very progressive in terms of programs and also science in terms of autism. If, in fact, uh, some people have said that New Jersey and California um, have such high rates because some function having to do with chemicals in the water. Is there any mm -hmm. proof of that? There is, there really, the science is looking into that. Uh, really, it is autism, we feel, is a neurobiological disorder, and it is also impacted by environmental factors. So what those factors are, we do not know definitively at this time. But research is being done, but it seems to me that that you can say that about most um, illnesses, most challenges, diseases, that the environment is impacting the vi biology. So autism seems to be like that. Well, tell me about the markers. Tell me about how I have a little baby, I have a grandchild, and I look at them, and all the kids look alike in the beginning. Sure. But how do I diagnose that that child may very well have autism? Do they not focus well? Do they not point? Well, what's, well what's, pointing what's a good... pointing is actually a very a very um, it might be a sign. You know, I think that that if they don't point, if they don't point, if they, for instance, if you say to a child of two years old, point to your nose, and they don't react to that. Uh, it's not that you would run to a pediatrician for that. I mean, you take that coupled with a, a whole array of other things. But there are certain developmental milestones and markers that children reach at particular ages. And I think, you know, parents need to be and grandparents need to speak to the pediatrician and make sure that their child is meeting those milestones. And if they're concerned, the parent has the, the parent is the best expert throughout the lifespan, not just for little children, but for adult children. Uh, you are the best expert as a parent or a grandparent if you're, you know, very involved in your children's lives. And if you feel that something is not right, a pediatrician is the best person to go to. And that pediatrician should have an array of experts to further, you know, do evaluations. And that's what I would totally recommend. What, what uh, uh, pointing they've said is one mm -hmm. marker. Right. I guess my, my two-year-old granddaughter walks over to the to the kitchen, points in the, right. to, and says, cookie is in good shape then. Yes. Because that's all she looks at. And, <laughs> but what are other real ones that I and parents and grandparents should be sensitive to? Are there other shorthand things that are, you know, obviously, you're talking about very sophisticated neurological testing and all of that, doctors and specialists. Mm -hmm. But just for, for those of us that are grandparents and parents, are there any other shorthand type things? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that if you have a child and they're not talking at a certain age, you know, children, of course, it's variable. But if you feel like, let's say there's other children in the family and most of the children are speaking, saying the first few words at a year old, or, and then now this child is two years old or even younger, they're not doing that. Certain behavioral things, um, certain children, they um, might have um, habits where they'll line up toys or, you know, they'll, they'll, they're just behaviorally, they're discontented, maybe lots of crying, lots of, but I hate to give, you know, like those as specific things that, you know, oh my gosh, well, let's throw the red flag up because that's not necessarily so. So that's why I'm, you know, I think that the, the idea is it's almost an instinct. I think that if you as a grandfather felt that one of your grandchildren, you know, they're not like the other grandchildren in their development, they don't seem to be responsive when I call their name or speak to them, they seem to, you know, run around a lot or have, you know, a little different than the other grandchildren or children that I've known in my lifetime, then I think it's time to, to go to your pediatrician or a specialist and get some, you know, more definition about that. May I ask you a mm -hmm. personal question? Yes. When did you first know that Danny was autistic? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, interestingly, the things I'm telling you is how he was my first child. So, but he had cous two cousins, the exact same age, basically. One was eight months older, a boy, and one was four months older, a boy. So as I was watching them develop, I, I looked at them, and of course, knowing that each child is an individual, but still, they were, started to talk, they started to do certain things, and I felt that Danny wasn't meeting those milestones. Um, he was also extremely active, um, and so, you know, and lots of kids living with autism are very active, um, you know, they, they, because they lack the focus that some other children might have. Physically active. Physically active. And so, you know, that coupled with the, the really minimal language and minimal attention span caused concern. Um, and actually, it was one of Danny's grandparents who was a school teacher, and she came to us, and I must say, and, I'm, and it's very difficult, especially with your first child. We were a bit defensive, but she sure. said, you know, uh, we think that you should take Danny to the pediatrician and talk about these things. And I'm very grateful that she said that because it kind of, you know, opened the window, <laughs> so to speak, and, and let the light in so that we could help Danny. And so it was a, a gift that she did so that. So one of his grandparents the, the, said, you, you really ought to take him to a doctor. Yes. You took him, I assume, to a pediatrician. Yes. And the pediatrician did what? Well, at first the pediatrician, because as I said, going back, you know, 15 or, or so years ago, more than that actually, 18 years ago, um, the pediatrician was reticent to make a diagnosis and basically said that boys, you know, especially boys get their language a little later in game, but I would not take that as a final answer. And I said, that is perhaps so, but I really feel that there, you know, that I'd like to speak with somebody who is really focused on diagnosing young children. And we, we did, we pursued that. So I would counsel parents, if you still feel that the answer you're getting is not the answer in your heart, in your gut that feels right, continue to pursue till you get Where the do answer. I go? Where do I go if I'm a, well, I'm it, a teacher and yeah. Said, yeah, I'm not happy with that pediatrician's mm -hmm. knowledge base. I want someone to tell me if he has a learning disability. Where do mm -hmm. I go? Well, there are developmental pediatricians you can go to, and then there are, you know, there are. Uh, we have centers of excellence here in New Jersey, autism centers that uh, one can go to. So, you know, there are places How do in I the find community. Them? Well, we have a resource guide on our website. Um, so for, we'll note so, that. So, so, uh, well, your website is, is um, me your yes, the website is um, djfiddlefoundation.org. So, uh, and, or you can Google the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation. And, and that get to will our have website. on it a kind of handbook. Yes, there's a resource guide on the homepage, and it has all kinds of resource, resources in the state of New Jersey, including uh, physicians. So that would be a good starting place. And also schools, quite frankly, you know, especially and if, if there's a school that, serve, that serves special needs children in your community, that would be, even if your child doesn't go there, 
call them up and say, can you recommend uh, a developmental pediatrician or a, a specialist, uh, you know, who works with children uh, living with autism. So your son was nine? He was nine when he uh, passed away. When he passed away. When did you first notice he was autistic? When he was about two, oh, two so years school, old. Oh, so he wasn't in school. He yet. wasn't in school yet. And as soon as we, as soon as we discovered um, that this was a, a challenge that he was facing, we, we helped to actually found a school in New York City called the Gillen Brewer School, which is still in existence today. At the time, it was just a preschool, and now it goes through, um, I think children are uh, 12, 13 years old. Where is that located? It's located in Manhattan. Wonderful. Yes, and it's a wonderful school, uh, and uh, we've actually started separate from the foundation. We have an arts enrichment program there for the children, so it's, that's now, Danny love that. <laughs> were you subject to any trauma when you were pregnant with him? No, no. It was a typical have you had pregnancy. Other yes, I do. So they don't have autism. No, I, she's a, my daughter is a um, a college freshman, and she's a, um, a vibrant and thankfully healthy young woman. It's so difficult to really understand it, and and, uh, and it must have made your life very difficult. Well, I, I I think that you know I look at it this way that yes, there were certain challenges and difficulties, um, but there there are so much that my son brought to my life, and so many gifts, and so many wonderful special things that I would never have encountered if it wasn't for him. So like everything in life, all the great things in life, I believe, that, that there's good and there's difficulty, and that's what makes them so special. Tell me a little bit about uh, your foundation. Yeah, so, you know, so, so eventually we got Danny into the Gillen Brewer School, and then we moved to New Jersey when he got older, and he attended the Forum School, which is another wonderful program in Waldwick, New Jersey, and, um, during his life, as he was progressing, I started to be concerned about what was going to happen to him when he attained adulthood, because really at that time, and right. you know, there really were very few programs, and the focus was still just on young children and getting them into programs that they can stay in until age 21. Uh, so after Danny passed away, we decided to continue working on autism and I particularly said that we should focus on adults because nobody else was focusing on adults living with autism. What happens to these children after they age out of the school system? And I, I think in the media we're starting to have lots of parents question that. Well we were questioning that a decade ago and so we started the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation and put together a wonderful board of trustees. And I'm proud to say that our board has pretty much, in a whole decade, remained the exact same people. That's the dedication. And another point is we're all volunteers, including myself. So we work 24-7 to help the people um, that we serve. And the people we serve are adults and their families. Now that was an issue when we had our last discussion mm -hmm. of autism, um, and, and I raised it. What happens when you people are gone? Who's going to take care of these, um, not children, adults? And they said that is one of the areas that gives us the most nightmares. Well, you know, I what what we aspire for is for there to be this kind of seamless transition where children are, during their school years up to age 21, they're gaining skills that they can use as adults. And when they attain adulthood, they can then go into the community and work with the right supports. Some can work very independently, others need a great deal of support, but they can contribute to community life and also live in the community in a variety of settings that are suitable for their individual needs and be part of the community. And if we can achieve that goal, and that's the goal that the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation is continuously working on, um, then if we can achieve that goal, then parents and caregivers will have less to worry about because their children will be part of community life. 
and that is the goal we have for all people living with autism. What, what type of skill sets uh, do you have, Linda, that you would pass on or train people in? You mean people living with yeah, autism? Right. They have as, people living with autism are like you and me. They have a variety of skills and talents, and what we have to do is focus on their strengths and talents as individuals. Some people are fantastic with computers. Some people are fantastic artists. Some people are, are actually quite sociable and are good in social kinds of settings, can work in store, grocery stores, can work in a variety of stores. Um, a lot of uh, people living with autism enjoy doing what maybe you or I might consider mundane tasks like like work scanning items at a, at a library that are returned or something like that but to them that's enjoyable work. So we have to focus on what the individual likes, give them the experience in the community to, to figure out what they like through different job sampling while they're in school and then open the door to let them work in the community, uh, get a wage, and be part of, of, of community life. So you do a kind of individual inventory of what people's skills are and how they would fit in with different jobs and well, we don't. To, to, who does that? Well, we don't. We do, we don't do it. What the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation does is we are act as a social entrepreneur. We go to service providers who do what you're talking about, who make these assessments, who who have clientele who live on the spectrum, who and these are adults, and we we give them ideas. Let's say they're doing a program that is. Um, a, an, a bowling program or, or in the community for people living with other kinds of challenges. And we say to them, will you do a recreational program for adults? And then we help them cultivate that program, organize it, create a blueprint for setting it up and for sustaining it. And then they, as experts in running programs, run the program. So we, we give them ideas. And I work with service providers around the country who have various expertise and help them develop programs suitable for adults living with autism. How many grants do you give out a year? Well, right now, I mean, we've given out uh, over the course of a decade, we've given out several hundred grants to programs all around the country. But right now, our focus is on what we're calling the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation Signature Programs. And these are programs where I have gone to uh, exemplary service providers, the best in the country, and help them develop. So we co-develop a program relating to adults. So right now we have about 10 of those programs and what we're doing is we are, they're multi-year programs because they're new programs to the world of adults living with autism. I'll give you some examples in a moment. But these programs what we're going to do is blueprint them so that grassroots communities around the country can take them like you would a blueprint of a house and build their own programs. Mm -hmm. And we feel that this is the best way to disseminate programs and to, and to address the growing needs of adults because there are so many more people aging up into uh, adult life. And you know, there's one in 70 children in New Jersey are diagnosed with autism and all of those children will be growing up. So we need to, to share these great program ideas. Is there a difference in lifespan between those people who have autism and those who do not? Not generally. However, many people living with autism have comorbidities. So, for instance, they met a third of people living with autism have epilepsy. So, you know, so that impacts their lives and what they do. Uh, um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is another. Uh, prevalent condition with autism. So the comorbidities are, are challenging and also, you know, one of the issues that we've identified is the health and wellness of people living with special needs um, of all kinds. And so one of our signature programs we're doing with an entity called Chapel Haven, which is a renowned program for people living with Asperger's syndrome in Connecticut. And we are working on a health and wellness blueprint 
so that people living with autism learn the proper protocols of diet and exercise and healthy cooking. And so that model is going to be shared in communities throughout the United States. What's the difference between Asperger and Alzheimer's? Is it just a matter of degree? Well, Asperger syndrome is really a um, it is really not anything relating to cognition. It's more related to social, social interactions skills, yeah. and social skills. And you know, classic autism has the component many times of a, a cognitive issue as well as the social and behavioral issues. Now, as you look at the foundation, um, where do you see yourselves going in five, 10 years? Well, what we're going to be doing, as I say, is really disseminating these, these great programs so that people in the grassroots, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, because autism doesn't just affect people in the United States, it affects people throughout the world. So we want to share these great programs and get communities engaged in helping adults living with autism um, within their communities because people living with autism need to be part of community life. In addition, we're very um, involved in advocacy efforts with our own um, senators he here in New Jersey, Senator Menendez and Senator Lautenberg, and within our state. And, you know, we feel that public policy can also help to drive um, the better um, life for adults living with autism. So we will continue our efforts regarding public policy. Now, in terms of public policy, it's mm -hmm. our, our bread and butter. Yes. Um, my understanding is that there's a bill or, or an executive order or something that was passed to increase the amount of money being put for autism research. Has that been, was that passed? I know Menendez supported that. I thought the president uh, signed something. Yes. Um, recently, um, uh, Senator Menendez was, was really one of the crafters of the Combating um, Autism Reauthorization Act, and we were very strongly advocating for um, all the senators and, and everyone in Congress to pass, and it, the bill did recently pass. And this will allocate more monies to the states for research. And also there's a program uh, component as well to enhance programs Where's and most services. Of research being done? Uh, throughout the country. Universities? Uh, univer I mean? Universities and centers of excellence and, um, you know, individual scientists as well. But, you know, the next piece of legislation that we're really um, hoping to achieve, it relates to programs and services because I, I, th I think there needs to be a good balance between research and serving the people who are actually here who need these services and supports desperately. So we are working with um, the senators on and, and everyone in Congress to, yeah. to really get them to, to focus on some of these other bills. But in the meantime, it's so important that we cultivate the awareness of our legislators. To our uh, dedicated and articulate uh, representative, uh, Linda Fiddle, of the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation and dealing with the issue of autism. And we're pleased to be able to bring another chapter on that to you. And we ask you to even go back and take a look at our three previous shows on the question of autism. Linda, thank you very much thank for being you. here today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.